here tonight um, is Danielle Tetro, yes, um, who is a wetland scientist and a biologist graduating from Unity College. Uh, she performs rare plant studies and invasive uh, plant removal, which we also do with Friends of Mary Reading Bay and monitoring. Uh, botanical inventories for the New England Wildflower Society, and uh, monitored new nesting activity for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, currently, Danielle is the project scientist for Stanford <coughs> Consulting, with whom we've worked on several of our projects, including um, the current study that we've done in the carp project, the invasive carp project we're working on right now. We're doing the Stantec as well. Um, where she leads large-scale natural resource surveys associated with wind power, transmission and pipeline development, and then organizing large amounts of field survey, survey data for state and federal permitting purposes. So Danielle is going to teach us all about frogs and salamanders and big nights. So we're going to find out what making a big night is. But tonight, being 50 degrees all day is a great time to start this discussion. So Danielle, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for coming out. This was a great presentation to put together for this time of year because I really got to think about springtime and everything I love about springtime when there's two and a half feet of snow outside my window. And uh, today I was listening to the frog call CD that we have at our office and really got me in the Vernal Pool mood. <laughs> so tonight we'll be talking about the big night and vernal pools and the species that you'll find in vernal pools. Um, yeah. So we're going to cover quite a bit of information and I'm going to try to keep it to this agenda. If anyone has any questions while I'm talking, please feel free to put your hand up or just ask. I'm, I love answering questions. Um, so this figure I have on my agenda shows the maximum distances that these species travel from their vernal pool. I don't know, can you see the text okay? Um, the blue spotted salamander travels a maximum of 650 feet from their pool. And then you've got the wood frog who travels a maximum of 1,550 feet. That's a huge, huge distance for a, a tiny little frog. And I came upon this very interesting fact a few years ago. Um, one scientist compared wood frogs to the barren caribou up in the Arctic. And when you account for the body size and the distance that they travel, the wood frog travels the same distance per gram of body weight as the barren caribou, which is unbelievable to me just to put those two species together as a, any kind of comparison. A and it's 13 times greater than the wildebeest. And uh, Aram Calhoun has researched the migration patterns of wood frogs and salamanders extensively with the University of Maine. I'm sure if you're all interested in vernal pools, you've heard of Aram. She's the author of every reference that I used for this presentation and consults with the IFMW for everything related to vernal pools, especially. Uh, she organized the municipal vernal pool studies that Brunswick and Topsom put together or volunteered to do for the town and organized the citizen surveys that went along with that. And did anyone here participate, do those surveys? Yeah, I did them for my town too, it was pretty fun. So, what is the big night? Before we talk about the big night, we have to go back a step because these amphibians right now aren't doing anything. They're just waiting for spring to happen. And this video that I'm about to show you is from Nova. And wood frogs freeze basically solid for the winter. They're like flat line dead. Not dead, but very close to dead. They're frozen 
And um, I, I don't need to describe it because they're going to talk about it. It's fascinating. Camouflaged. His coloration is the same as the soil around him. You see him here? He's cold. You can find them here in southern Ohio and all the way up to the Arctic Circle. But wherever they are, once it gets cold with the first sprinkle of ice, this frog does something I didn't know was possible. As soon as the frog touches, just touches an ice crystal, this animal is going to freeze. Freeze, freeze? Freeze, solid freeze. That touch of ice immediately sets off signals inside the frog, says Professor John Costanzo, that pulls water away from the center of its body so the frog's internal organs are now wrapped in a puddle of water that then turns to solid ice. I, I, I still can't get over it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. There is no breathing, no kidney function. The heart stops. And there will be no heartbeat for a long period of time. You mean as in no heartbeat? Right. Nothing? Flatline. Flatline? For an hour or two? It could be for days, perhaps even weeks. Really? It sounds like it's virtually dead, no? We know that the frog isn't dead, but he's probably about as close as you can get. To being dead? Yes. <laughs> So, from the outside, this little frog feels like a rock. Except that as it froze, the frog flooded itself with a kind of sugar. The frog's blood sugar is distributed through the circulatory system. It works like an antifreeze. It's harder for the water to freeze, so cells stay just damp enough for the animal to hold itself together. Until the springtime. When the days grow a little longer, and the ground gets a little warmer. And then, well, a kind of miracle happens. After weeks or months of no heartbeat, none, suddenly, there's a pulse. And that first heartbeat leads to another, and then another. And then within a day, and in the case of this little frog, it took about mm, 10 hours, the animal literally comes back to life. Spontaneous resumption of function. Why? We don't know. We don't know what triggers that event. And think how elegant a business this is. Because although the sun is warming up the outside of this little guy, somehow his insides, his heart, his brain, they thaw first. His insides warm up before his outsides. But somehow it all happens in perfect synchrony every spring. Yes, and it's going to undertake a very energetic activity. It's mating time. You mean hours after it thaws, it's going to do it with a lady? It's going to perform. Uh -huh. <laughs> what an animal. Can we say that on I TV? I don't know whether we can or not. <laughs> well, we just did. are just right and the timing is perfect that's 
when you get the big night. It's the mass migration that these amphibians go through to get to their home pool. But in reality, most years it's a few medium nights. <laughs> Not always a, a big night. And it's actually believed that most of these amphibians return to the pools that they hatched from. In some cases, they'll go to a pool that they come upon along their way, like say a, a ditch that's open water and available and easier to get to than their vernal pool that they came from. And of course, for genetic diversity, there has to be some amount of new animals coming into each pool, so they're not just breeding with each other forever. But for the most part, they'll go to the pool that they came from. And so all of these animals are traveling, traveling, and they end up at their vernal pool, and they take part in something called a congress, which is a, they all made at the same time. They're all together in the pool. They're swimming around and having a grand old time. To observe a big night, you really need to pay attention to the weather patterns. Again, you're looking for the warm spring night, temperatures over 40, 50 degrees, rainy, perfect conditions for an amphibian to be out and you'll want to watch the road crossings where these vernal pools, the connections between the vernal pools and their associated upland or wetland habitat. So it helps to know where your local vernal pool is. I don't know what the reproductive age is, but I know that for the first year they mostly stay near the vernal pool that they hatched out of. So you're gonna to wanna to know where your local vernal pool is. Most towns, I know that Brunswick and Topsom have those mapped on their um, zoning, land use planning maps. And then you can look at aerial photos on the internet and see where their forested core goes on. That depends. We're going to get into sort of regulatory definitions of things a little bit later, but a lot of times it's just up to the scientist. I mean, technically anything that holds egg masses could be considered a vernal pool, but it, most people wouldn't call. I've seen them breed in anything. When we hear the speakers speaking, mm -hmm. we're actually hearing the babies speak? Those are the adults. That's how they attract their mates. In some cases, yeah. And peepers are different. I don't know as much about the behaviors of peepers. They are, yep. Sure. So the adult basically breeds once and leaves and doesn't come back? Not until the next year. They no. might come back and use the habitat later in the year, but their time there for breeding is done. Okay. So what is a vernal pool? There's lots of different definitions according, depending on who you ask and what agency or group, but it's basically a pool of water that fills in the spring and fall, and usually they dry out during the hottest part of the year, and they host the breeding activity for amphibians. And it's important to note that the 
they're defined by the breeding activity, not just being a pool of water. So regulatory agencies have definitions that they use in order to protect these resources. And they have created these definitions in an attempt to exclude habitat that is considered a population sink where the juveniles and larvae will not survive. And I've included on the slide um, a pretty basic definition of what each agency that we typically work with considers a vernal pool. The Maine Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, uh, considers a vernal pool to be a naturally occurring temporary or semi-permanent body of water, no inlet, no viable population of predatory fish, and it provide, or it provides habitat for rare species. And the DEP also regulates significant vernal pools, which have to meet certain um, productivity standards, which I'll get into a little bit later. And these species that I've listed are species which may use vernal pools at some point in the year but they do not require vernal pools to complete any portion of their life cycle. They just may happen to be there. The Army Corps of Engineers considers a vernal pool to be a temporary or permanent body of water with no fish, and it may be a man-made depression within a wetland. The Army Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction only over wetland habitats. So if there's a, just a puddle in the middle of someone's yard that has egg masses in it, the um, Army Corps of Engineers would not necessarily care about that. Yeah. So what species use vernal pools? This is a picture of two wood frogs in a vernal pool. Uh, the male is the smaller wood frog. They are generally smaller than the females. And the male will fertilize the, each egg in the egg mass as the female deposits it on vegetation or other egg masses or usually vegetation. Um, the dark splotches in this picture are the egg masses. They start out about the size of a ping pong ball. They're very compact, concentrated balls of individual eggs. And then over time, within a few days, they'll absorb water and expand to be about the size of a softball. Um, the eggs are dark on the top so that they'll absorb heat and allow the embryos to develop and they're light colored on the bottom, which reduces predation from insects and things from below. Wood frogs are considered and called explosive breeders, which means that in some pools and for some frogs, their entire breeding cycle from when they thaw to when they leave the pool after depositing all of their eggs could occur in as little time as a week. And some frogs may remain in the pools for up to a month to complete, which is why sometimes later in the spring you'll still hear the wood frogs quacking in the, in the wetlands. And really, the amount of time that they spend depends on how much fat reserves they have left over from the winter. Yes, they are one and a half to two and three quarter inches long. Yeah. So the adults are a pinkish brown body color 
and they have a blackish brown mask over their eyes and a stripe that extends from their eye to the front of their nose. Their call is a duck-like quacking, which is different from the peepers, which is a peep. I love that sound. <laughs> so you can hear the peepers peeping, and that quacky noise is the, is the wood frogs. The females will lay eggs, egg masses, in some cases in what we call rafts, which could be hundreds of egg masses all together at once. And at that point when we're counting them, we just, it's impossible to get an, an exact number because they're just layers deep and large, large areas of these egg masses. Fascinating. This uh, top picture shows a tadpole that is developing its hind legs. They're kind of hard to see. They're very faint. But they'll develop their hind legs first, and then their front legs will develop. And then slowly their tail will disappear. And then the picture on the right is what we call a froglet. And they are just miniature versions of the adult. And that's a regular sized mechanical pencil. That's a very, very tiny little frog. It was smaller than a quarter. So it takes the tadpoles about two to three weeks to hatch. They're dark brown in color. I think we've all seen a polywog. Um, and they are actually voracious predators. They will eat other uh, larvae that are in the, in the pool. They'll eat other invertebra invertebrates in the pool. And I've seen lots of times where they're just on a spotted salamander egg mass, just like trying to burrow in and get it to the embryo in there. Uh, another species that uses vernal pools is the spotted salamander. Males and females will practice a very elegant courtship called Congress, which I talked about a little bit earlier. The males will deposit a gelatinous spermatophore on the, the bottom of the pool, and the females will collect a spermatophore, which will fertilize an egg mass and then she will deposit it on a, a leaf or on the bottom of the pool or on a s stick or stem or something. And it could take a spotted salamander up to six weeks for them to finish their breeding process. They are not explosive breeders like the wood frogs. These adults are four to six inches from head to tail. Scientists believe that they live up to 20 years, which is pretty crazy. And the adults might not breed every year. When they're finished with breeding, they'll return to their upland habitats, and they typically spend the summers in um, small burrows, moist habitats, areas where they can get to slugs and spiders and beetles and things. But because the salamanders take longer to complete their process, they're not explosive, they, um, when you're doing a vernal pool survey, typically they say to do your wood frog survey two weeks after you hear full chorus of wood frogs. And then two weeks later, you go back to the pool to visit and see the 
spotted salamanders. So that's the reason for a, a delay in the second visit. So the females will deposit one to three egg masses. One is usually larger than the other two. And this largest picture shows a typical raft of many egg masses attached to some floating grasses. The cloudy egg masses are actually a inherited trait from female um, salamanders. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's perfectly normal. Some have it, some don't. And some egg masses may have a, a green looking hue to them and it's just an algae that is um, taking over, also harmless. It'll take four to eight weeks for the embryos to hatch from these eggs. And that's in New England when the temperature is 50 degrees or higher. And the larvae are heavily preyed upon by all sorts of things. Other tadpoles, very large beetles, they're very delicate. And you can see in the upper right picture, that's a spotted salamander larvae. You can tell because they have the feathery gills on the side. Wood frog tadpoles do not have that. Their um, tail is shaped a little bit differently too. It's shaped more like it's going to turn into an actual tail instead of just a little fin. And then you can see in the bottom right picture this, this one is very close to turning into a young salamander, but it still has its feathery aquatic gills. The larvae are most active in the evening at night and they feed on plankton in, in the pool. For one of these larvae to turn into a young salamander, it takes 10 to 14 weeks. So a vernal pool needs to have enough water to sustain these larvae for that period of time. So that puts us mid-July, early August for the um, pool to dry out. And the young salamanders will be two to two and a half inches long when they emerge. And some researchers have studied the spotted salamander and have found that the young salamanders stay within about 100 feet of the vernal pool during their first winter. Oh, I didn't really talk about the egg masses besides the color. They're very firm and they have this outer coating of, it's like a jelly and they're um, kind of kidney shaped and they feel like what I imagine a kidney would actually feel like. I've never felt a kidney, but I imagine it would be a little bit squishy and kind of firm. <laughs> Another species that you might find in a vernal pool, but they're pretty uncommon, is a blue spotted salamander. This is a very complicated genetically complicated group. They hybridize and there's a hybrid that is also common and the it's called Jefferson's or Jefferson salamander and the Jefferson salamander is almost entirely female and they're able to pick up spermatophores and fertilize their egg masses with closely related salamanders. The adults are very hard to tell apart, the Jefferson and the blue spotted, so there's not much distinction on a regulatory level about which is which and who is who and who's mating with who. It's, it's all very complicated genetics that I don't entirely understand. <laughs> they start throwing out diploid and polyploid and I just want to know what the egg masses look like. In general, the blue spotted salamander is less common across the landscape than the regular spotted salamander. 
But I found when doing vernal pool surveys that when you find a pool that has blue spotted salamander egg masses in it, there are a lot of blue spotted egg masses in there, more than the spotted vernal <laughs> spotted salamanders. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of the egg masses. The picture in the middle shows both the middle egg mass is a regular spotted salamander, and the two on the outside are blue spotted salamander. The blue spotted salamander egg masses lack that really thick gelatinous outer coating, which you can tell in the, the bottom picture, it, ju it's ca it drips off the sticks that they attach to. It's very hard to keep them together. And they're deposited in much smaller groups than the spotted salamander. It could be one egg, or it could be 10 eggs in an egg mass. But again, very drippy. As far as the adult behavior goes, the blue spotted salamander spends more time at the soil surface than the spotted salamander. The spotted salamander will be in burrows, and the um, blue spotted will be out and about. Some scientists have theorized that the blue spotted salamander is more tolerant to forest disturbance than the yellow spotted salamander. Another species that is not an amphibian that uses a vernal pool is the fairy shrimp. These are really cool. They're very uncommon. They're only reported from about 5% of the vernal pools in Maine that are reported to the DEP. And they're very ephemeral. They become active very early in the pool in the season and they will mate and lay their eggs and die before the embryos have hatched even for the amphibians. This is a very large specimen of a fairy shrimp. This was from a pool in Wells. Someone in the Wetlands group called it a jumbo fairy shrimp. <laughs> fairy shrimp will, they swim upside down and they use those feathery little appendages to propel themselves. And the eggs will dry out completely and then hatch when the pool fills up again. Again, very uncommon. I've only seen them in two or three pools during the time I've been doing vernal pool surveys. But it's a very special pool when you find them because they're so uncommon and the pools that you find them in are just the, the ideal pool that you imagine. Natural, very nice. So why are vernal pools important? We're all here, we all care. They provide important habitat for amphibians and er, invertebrates, which we've talked about. They, in a very small area of the vernal pool, there could be more than 30 species of animal, invertebrate, amphibian, anything. And that's a huge amount of diversity in a very small space. We tend to call those hotspots. So they provide a tremendous amount of biodiversity. They function as wetlands and in wetlands. And other functions of the wetlands could include flood protection, water quality improvement, wildlife habitat, And uh, some even provide educational opportunities if there's a trail nearby or it's on a preserve or within a other protected area. 
and they provide food. They're, they're a key place for other species to find food in the, the local food web. It's hard to choose a winner. So these hot spots of vernal of biodiversity are very key areas for protection. Sorry, I'm not speaking. Can everyone hear me when I'm not speaking into the mic? Okay. On the federal level, the US Fish and Wildlife Service protects wildlife. The Army Corps of Engineers protects or regulates activities in wetlands. And the EPA protects water quality. At the state level, the DEP uh, regulates activities in wetlands and water quality. And the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife protects wildlife. And then locally, planners and code enforcement officers ensure that development happens in the appropriate places. So this is the same slide as earlier. Just wanted to remind you all what each group is looking at for the definition. And it, I realize that the amphibians is not on the DEP list, but they do look for the amphibian species. When we are working for clients who are looking to develop a piece of land and we go out and do our wetland surveys and our vernal pool surveys, we always recommend that they avoid because it saves money. It saves them money for permitting. It saves them money for compensation, for any impacts that they may be proposing. It saves them money for my time for uh, coordinating with the agencies. So that's always our first recommendation. And then we like to work with them to find the best alternatives. Yes. For some projects, there, um, there's a, a program where you have to either provide land protection, restoration, or just give money to a program that will fund other projects to compensate for wetland losses. It's called the in-lieu fee program. The Nature Conservancy operates it. Yeah, they're, they will use the vernal pool for, um, the, the turtles especially will use it for estivation. So they'll bury themselves under a mound in the wetland and stay there for the summer when it's really hot out. So they, they don't require the pool, but they will use it. And then obviously for food sources. Regulatory process. The permitting process is complicated. And it, it it's complicated. Especially when you get to that point. So these are some of the regulations about the vernal pools that each agency may require, depending on what you're doing, where you're doing it. Um, for the DEP, which we work most closely with, and oftentimes the Army Corps of Engineers is, accepts the um, regulations set forth by the DEP. Um, the DEP will regulate significant vernal pools only. So they're looking for 40 wood frog egg masses, 20 spotted salamander egg masses, 10 blue spotted salamander egg masses, any number of fairy shrimp, or it, these are ores, not ants, um, or any of those rare species that I listed on the previous slide, which use the vernal pools but don't require them. And they're most concerned with the area within 250 feet of the vernal pool boundary. 
and it's we it, the main association of wetland scientists calls it a consultation zone which is an area where you have to talk to the DEP and percentages come into play and it's complicated um, and then local protection varies by town. Some towns have their own vernal pool regulations. Topsom and Brunswick do not, but they've mapped the vernal pools in the town. Um, and they're usually protected under some kind of resource protection zone or other similarly named zoning process. So this is a close-up of the egg mass identification. You can really see that gelatinous mass around the, the egg embryos in the spotted salamander on the right, or the left. Pretty amazing. And that is all that I have. Does anyone have any other questions?